Well, Mary Sidney Herbert is an important figure in the life of Elizabethan England and in literature. Although she's not really known today, her contributions to literature have really influenced the course of English poetics, especially the lyric poem. Her most important work in this regard, I think, is her translation of the Psalms. This translation was begun by her brother, Sir Philip Sidney, and cut short by his untimely death. He completed 43, the first 43 of the Psalms, and she took up the rest from Psalm 44 to Psalm 150. And her translations are actually better than his, and is probably the most enduring contribution she made to English poetry. They introduced new modes of devotional expression and showed how the Elizabethan lyric could be used as an appropriate method for enacting the inner experience of devotion and piety. Mary Sidney was born in 1561 to Sir Henry Sidney and his wife Mary Lady Dudley. Mary Sidney and her brothers grew up in Ticknell Place in Worcestershire in England. Mary's mother was a scholar and a poet, and she educated the young Mary Sidney. Certainly she would have recognized that Mary had an aptitude for literature and languages. She learned Italian, French, Latin, Greek. Some scholars believe that she even learned Hebrew from one of her chaplains, and it seems likely that she did. In 1575, when Mary was just 15 years old, she married. Her husband was Henry Herbert, the Earl of Pembroke, and she began managing his, his home. So she became the Countess of Pembroke and began managing the affairs and had four children with Henry. But she also dedicated herself to the literary arts at this time and became a patron. John Aubrey, later in the 17th century, would describe how this house had become like a little college, he says. Wilton House was like a college where there were so many learned and ingenious persons. She was the greatest patroness of wit and learning of any lady in her time. Now the 1580s was a difficult decade for Mary Herbert. Uh, it was a trying time for most of England. She began writing during this period, and she lost a daughter in 1584, the same day that her son Philip was born. Two years later, in 1586, she lost both her father and mother, and she was likely the only one of the immediate family who was there at the funeral because her three brothers were fighting in Holland against the Spaniards. England at this time was in a bitter feud, war with Spain. And so she had actually removed to the country for many years through all of this loss, through all of this, this war, she managed the house and continued with her writing. In October of 1586 came a huge blow. Her brother, Sir Philip Sidney, after being wounded in battle, had died of an infection. This was a huge loss, not just to Mary Sidney Herbert, but also to the country. England mourned him as well as Holland, and he became a literary martyr for the Protestant cause. For Mary, this was almost too much to bear, and she actually remained in the country until 1588 when the Spanish Armada was defeated by the English. After that defeat of the Spanish Armada, there was a rise of literary activity. It heralded in a new era of English pride in English letters, and so Mary, after the war, returned to London and began supporting the arts, including managing her, her brother's literature that he left behind. This was a really exciting time for a female poet in England. Um, England had just emerged from the Protestant Reformation uh, earlier in the century and had just defeated the Spanish, so now there was this new English pride. And one of the questions that came out of that pride was, what is it? what does an English Protestant literature look like? And many poets, including Edmund Spencer, Michael Drayton, were contributing to the uh, secular arts of English literature, and she supported them. This is when she really began to develop a circle of literary friends, of literary society, and of just poets and critics and dramatists. Shakespeare might have even visited Wilton House, although he would have been admitted through the back door, I think, which was reserved for, for, for non-aristocratic guests. It's interesting to imagine, but when Mary did return to London, she was in the heart of literary life. She herself wrote not only translations, but her own lyric poetry and her own drama. What was her secular poetry like? Well, I think it's pretty representative of the English lyric and English drama at the time. She did take an interest in tragedy, and she wrote a play called Antonius, based on Anthony and Cleopatra, the French version, not Shakespeare's, and it was published in 1592. This, by the way, was the first play published by a woman in England. Let me show you a specimen from her play. This is from Act Five of Antonius, um, and this is a part of Cleopatra's lament. O cruel fortune, 
O accursed lot, O plaguy love, O most detested brand, O wretched joys, O beauties miserable, O deadly state, O deadly royalty, O hateful life, O queen most lamentable, O Anthony, by my fault variable. Notice the accumulation here of this passionate O, and the Elizabethan lyric has this one quality of being extremely passionate. We have the O repeated throughout with this anaphora, this repetition of the O at the beginning of the lines. But notice too the repetition of this able, O beauty's miserable, lamentable, and then this surprising turn, which is surprising, the Elizabethans loved surprise, which is partly what gave rise to the metaphysical style. O oh, Anthony, by my fault, buriable. The idea that Anthony is buriable instead of saying he is dead. It, it, it elides his death, but also surprises us with this condition of being buriable. Um, that's inventive for, for her. And then you have this, O oh, hellish work of heaven, alas. Hellish work of heaven, nice paradox here and the repetition of this E working throughout. And then, alas, the wrath. We have that, that sound interlinking of the, or the short A. And then you have it coming down in this final line. You have to read it. Let me back up to the second to last line. Oh, hellish work of heaven. Alas, the wrath of all, the wrath of all the gods at once on us is fallen. You can hear that rhythm really just coming to a thud there at the end. I think this is really good poetry. It's just a very passionate, heightened expression here in this tragedy. So it's worth reading if you're interested in Elizabethan drama outside of Shakespeare. It's worth reading because it's the first lay published by, by a woman. And so it's worth experiencing, I think. This quality of interlinking sounds, of surprise, of steady, artful rhythm are the qualities of her psalm translation. So let's turn to her psalms. Now, Mary Sidney Herbert's psalms and her brother's translations of the psalms were not printed. They were not published in print for many years. It wasn't until the 19th century that they were finally printed. So they moved around through a coterie. Friends would copy the translations out and then send them to other friends. It was like a literary society in which people had certain capital based on the poems that were given to them by poets and then passed around. Much of John Donne's early poetry was passed around this way in a literary circle. And, and so, you know, you would have conversations in the court. Oh, did you, did you read John Donne's The Flea? Or have you read Mary Sidney Herbert's Psalm 117? And they said, no, I don't have that one. And he said, well, I'll, I'll get you a copy. Uh, I'll copy it out for you. And so these psalms and poems circulated in this manner um, outside of the press. And it's something that we don't really think about when thinking about literature circulating. We think it only comes through the press. But at this time, the coterie culture, the idea of an inner circle, was uh, really how much of this poetry was circulated at the time. Another thing to mention about Sidney's psalm translations is uh, just because these are translations doesn't mean that these are lesser poems. I want us to look at these translations as poems in themselves. This is how they would have considered the psalms anyway. Translation in Elizabethan England was an exciting type of poetry. Translations just didn't give access. That tends to be how we contemporary readers think about a translation. Oh, it allows me to read it. But this is a society in which many of the members, especially in the upper tiers, all knew other languages. And so they, they didn't need translation for access. They wanted it for enjoyment. They wanted to make something new, yet faithful to the translation, but beautiful in English. And this is what the translations did. Now, talking a little bit more about the reading culture, I want to show you Psalm 117, translated by Mary Sidney Herbert. Here it is. What does this tell us? Let's look, it's short. This is one of the shortest Psalms, even in the Hebrew. Praise him that I remains the same. All tongues display Jehovah's fame. Sing all that share this earthly ball. His mercies are exposed to all. Like as the word once he doth give, rolled in record doth time outlive. So we have the translation moving across this way, but we also have this imperative that's moving 
through an acrostic downward, down the page. What does this mean? What is this telling us? Partly it's telling us, it's reminding us that the Elizabethan lyric is emerging within a primarily private reading culture. People are reading silently to themselves, either from a printed page or from a handwritten page, and that reading is, is not just a communal experience, but a private one as well. And this is something that happened during the Renaissance and the Reformation. You have this rise in poetry becoming a literary visual art. You see this in Spencer's stanzas, where each one is kind of a visual unit. So poetry, like the shape poems of George Herbert, they're all emerging as a visual art, and that's what partly what this psalm is doing as well. Now, before we closely read one of Mary Sidney Herbert's most beautiful psalms, I want to show you how these poems compare to contemporary uh, translations. So, on the far left, we have our friends Sternhold and Hopkins and their translation of Psalm 119. As we know, Sternhold and Hopkins' translations were meant to be read communally and easily to the ballad form. And so this, you'll notice, is common measure. Even as a lantern to my feet, so doth thy word shine bright. And to my paths, where'er I go, it is a flaming light. That's pretty good. It's plain. It's rhythmic. It's faithful to the original. We have two, this is from Psalm 119. We have two, the Miles Coverdale version of the same Psalm. The Miles Coverdale version was what was in the Book of Common Prayer. So this was chanted in the liturgies of the daily office and in church. Here's Miles Coverdale. Thy word is a lantern unto my feet and a light unto my paths. I have sworn and am steadfastly purposed to keep thy righteous judgments. Different translations, different poems entirely, written for different contexts. One for the singing, set to a tune, the other for chanting or communal reading, public reading. And then we have Mary Sidney Herbert's Psalm 119. Oh, what a lantern, what a lamp of light is thy pure word to me, to clear my paths and guide my goings right. I swore and swear again, I of the statutes will observer be, thou justly dost ordain. In Mary, Sidney Herbert's version, we have overflow of powerful feelings, really. This is not a statement. This is an expression of joy and wonder. She begins, oh, with that very Elizabethan expression of passion. It reads as one who is in the act of meditation herself and suddenly is struck by the word. What a lantern, what a lamp of light. And it's this liveliness, this enactment of contemplation and spontaneous response to the language is partly what characterizes the Sydney Psalms. Mary Sidney Herbert really mobilized the lyric and the psalm translations as an expression of emotion. And this can be seen in her Psalm 55. I just want to go through and, and close read this poem just to show how she transforms this psalm into a poem of its own. My God, most glad to look, most prone to hear. Notice, you remember how the psalms, how the devotional lyric, really interested in seeing and being seen. Here's the address. Remember Sappho's hymn. Remember Moses' ode. My God, most glad to look, most prone to hear. It's looking and seeing that's very important for the lyric because it itself is not just something to be heard like a lyre, but something to be seen on a page. And hear an open ear, oh, let my prayer find. And from my plaint, turn not thy face away. In stop, period. Behold my gestures. Now, this is a strange request, asking God not just to hear, but to see bodily gestures. And so the lyric itself is, is into this um, interesting embodiment. Hearken what I say, listen, while uttering moans with most tormented mind, my body I no less torment and tear. For lo, their fearful threatenings would mine ear whose griefs on griefs on me still heaping lay. Notice this rhythm, it's accumulating. It's like the griefs on griefs on me still heaping lay. 
sounds of the E really being piled on there like the griefs, a mark to wrath and hate and wrong aside. What's happened? The poet, as with the original psalmist, has been injured and is crying to God, very much like Sappho's hymn, at least in that respect. Therefore, my heart hath all his force resigned to trembling pants. Death terrors on me, pray. I fear, nay shake, nay quivering th quake with fear. Poet is in distress, the soul is in distress. But notice too what the sound is doing. Notice it's all about hearing as well. My God, hear, open ear, with an open ear, oh. Let my prayer find. What is the sound of this stanza making? I'd say that the pro predominant sound is O, oh, the sound of a moan itself. Here it is in most. My God, most glad to look, most prone to hear. O, oh, let my prayer find. While uttering moans, there's the O, oh, with most tormented mind. I no less. There's another O, oh, for lo, their fearful threatenings would mine ear. So the poem itself is crying out in anguish. This is not just a statement made after the fact. This is very much in the moment, which the lyric is embodying. Her transits of thought, I fear, no, nay, shake, nay, quivering, quake with fear. And of course, this quivering is very important to the lyric because the lyre itself, the strings, how do they make sound? They quiver. And so there's this quivering, quaking that's making the sound itself within the poem. And then this impassioned wish. Then say I, O, oh, my tie but cut the wind, borne on the wing the fearful dove doth bear. Stay would I not, till I and rest might stay. Notice this apanalepsis, this rhetorical figure that the Elizabethans certainly uh, loved. Herbert will do this often in his poetry. And Herbert was very much inspired by Lady Sidney Herbert. In fact, if we didn't have these psalms, we wouldn't have George Herbert's The Temple. Read her translations and then read George Herbert's The Temple and you'll see just what Mary Sidney Herbert did for future devotional lyricists. Far hence, oh, far, then would I take my way unto the desert and repose me there. These storms of woe, these tempests left behind. Notice too the rhyme pattern for all of these stanzas. We have wind rhyming with behind, bear and there, stay and way. And so we have this coming to a point here with this couplet, which is not complete couplet, it's not a periodic couplet. It moves on, we have enjambment here, into the next, and then the same thing happens again. So this is the prayer she wishes the soul wishes to be like a dove and fly into the desert where no one can hurt her because she's been injured. This soul crying out to God. And then this imprecatory prayer, this prayer for justice. But swallow them, O Lord, in darkness blind. Confound their counsels. Notice this repetition here. Lead their tongues astray that what they mean by words may not appear. For mother wrong within their town each where and daughter strife their ensign so display as if they only thither were confined. Notice this personification of wrong and strife. And this continues here. These walk their city walls both day and night, daughter strife, mother wrong, oppressions, tumults, guiles of every kind are burgesses and dwell the middle near. About their streets, his masking robes doth wear mischief clothed in deceit. Another personified figure with treason lined. Very important to the Elizabethans. Edmund Spencer, probably the best master of personification and allegory, uh, will use uh, this as well and uses this as well as many others do, where only he, he only bears the sway. But not my foe with me, this prank did play. For then I would have borne with patient cheer an unkind part from whom I know unkind. Moving down. Now the poem has been making an address to God, has been reflecting on its own soul, the soul of its speaker, and now it's going to turn outward horizontally to the one who injured the soul. 
But this to thee, to thee impute I may, my fellow, my companion held most dear, my soul, my other self, my inward friend, whom unto me, me unto whom did bind. Notice this chiasmus here. Whom unto me, unto me, me unto whom. Another rhetorical figure that George Herbert and John Donne will use. Did bind exchanged secrets, who together were God's who together were God's temple want to visit there to pray. So we've learned that this person who has done harm to our speaker was a very close friend, which is the worst kind of harm. They used to go to God's temple and were wont there to pray, but the soul was betrayed by this bosom friend. Oh, let a sudden death work their decay, who speak fair such cankered malice mind. Let them be buried breathing in their beer, but purple morn, black even, in midday clear shall see my praying voice to God inclined. Shall see my praying voice. Isn't that strange? How do you how do you see a praying voice? Unless it's a written lyric. To God inclined. And this praying voice, which can be beheld, rouses him up, and naught shall me dismay. The soul is now moving from this friend who betrayed it and then turning back to God. So the horizontal reach is now moving back to a vertical. Why? For he ransomed me. He for my safety find and fight where many sought my soul to slay. He, still himself to no succeeding heir, leaving his empire, shall no more forbear, but at my motion. All these atheists pay by whom still one such mischiefs are designed. But who such caitiffs are wretches would have undermined, nay, overthrown. See this self-correction as as the soul is thinking aloud, the sonnet or the lyric poem is very interested in thinking aloud in words, in lyric. Who would such trust betray? What buttered words, yet war their hearts bewray, their speech more sharp than sharpest sword or spear. Notice these sharp sounds. The, the consonants are sharp, yet softer flows than balm from wounded rind. Notice how rough this verse is, notice how smooth this verse is, enacting the sense. There's the beautiful shape of sound and sense blended here. Yet softer flows than balm from wounded rind. This is the sort of metrical precision that Alexander Pope would laud. But my o'erloading soul, notice how the sounds are, are, are echoing the first stanza here at the end. Or load and soul. There's that moan, but it's not so much an, a moan of pain now. It's now a kind of optimistic, a wistful moan. Thyself up cheer. Cast on God's shoulders what thee down doth weigh. Long borne by thee with bearing pain and pined. Just, I mean, you really have to relish. I'm, I'm moving through this a little too quickly, but I want to just impress the, the, the metrical and sonic intricacies of these verses. Long born by thee. Born, bearing, a little bit of polyptoton here, pained and pined. To care for thee he shall be ever kind. So notice we've begun by addressing God, and then we moved out to this addressing the friend, then addressed God again, and now the soul is turning inward to the self. This reach, these turnings, within the lyric are characteristic of what devotional lyric poets will do after Mary Sidney Herbert. I mean, she's really opened the door to something powerful here. She's tapped into something. Changeless shall enter, live, and leave the year. But Lord, how long shall these men tarry here? And another imprecatory prayer, a prayer for justice. Fling them in pit of death where never shined the light of life. And while I make my stay on thee, Ah, what's changed? Remember in the second stanza, the soul was imagining a stay in a desert place away from everyone who could hurt her. Now she, now she's going to make a stay, not in the desert. Something has changed in her consciousness through the course of this lyric. She's now going to stay on God. And we'll see many of Herbert's poems snapping back at the end, where the lyric will take you on a long journey where 
the speaker is imagining different scenarios, different solutions, and then suddenly at the end comes to fall upon the right devotional attitude to make my stay on thee. Let their thirst with blood allay have their life-holding thread so weakly twined that it, half spun, death may in sunder shear. Boom. And she closes right there on that imprecatory, hot, angry wish for justice. Many of the Psalms are very interested in not just retribution, but social justice as well. And so this is something that we'll keep in mind moving forward into the other lyricists we'll look at in this series. George Herbert, John Donne, um, even Isaac Watts. Now in the final section of the video, I do want to turn to consider her achievement. What did these Psalms achieve for English literature? Uh, we've been talking a little bit around it through her contributions that we've examined so far, but let's see what John Donne said about it to get a sense of what her contemporaries recognized in these Psalms. This is from John Donne's Upon the Translation of the Psalms by Sir Philip Sidney and the Countess of Pembroke, his sister. You'll notice that this is just the form of praise. It's panegyric, but it's addressed to God and he's talking about the Sidneys and their, their Psalms. And we've had this vertical reach. It almost is itself a devotional poem. Eternal God, for whom whoever dare seek new expressions, do the circle square and thrust into straight corners of poor wit thee, who art cornerless and infinite. Here we have the formal address to God. It says, people are always trying to find new expressions to talk about you, and they square the circle, which is to say, do an impossible act by trying to contain you within the corners of poor wit, that is a language, who cannot be contained because he's God. This is the ineffability topos. I would but bless thy name, not name thee now, and thy gifts are as infinite as thou. Fix we our praises, therefore, on this one, that as thy blessed spirit fell upon these psalms first author in a cloven tongue, that would be David, for twas a double power by which he sung. What's this cloven tongue? What's this double power? One, it was highest matter in the noblest form. That form was lyric. The highest matter was God himself, expressed in the lyric in King David's psalms. So thou hast cleft that spirit, meaning divided it, to perform that work again, and shed it here upon two, by their bloods and by thy spirit one, a brother and sister, made by thee the organ where thou art the harmony. It's so characteristic of John Donne's metaphors. Two that make John Baptist's holy voice, and who that psalm, now let the isles rejoice, have both translated, and applied it to. Both told us what, and taught us how to do. They show us islanders, that's England, our joy, our king. This is what the Sydneys have done, according to John Donne. They've translated and applied the Psalms. They, they haven't just given us a paraphrase. They actually put it into motion, given it a voice, and given it a human spirit in a particularly English expression. They tell us why and teach us how to sing. Make all this, all three choirs, heaven, earth, and spheres, the first heaven hath a song, but no man hears. The spheres have music, but they have no tongue. Talking about the, the music of the spheres, which no mortals can hear. Moving down, the organist is he who hath tuned God to man. Bringing this metaphor back, playing with this image. Now the organ we, the songs, that is their translations, are these which heaven's high holy muse whispered to David, David to the Jews and David's successors in holy zeal, and forms of joy and art do re-reveal to us so sweetly and sincerely too. So what are the qualities he's valuing here? Not just accuracy, not just setting into motion, into English, this devotional experience, but that they're sweet and sincere. Very hard to do when you're metrically precise and, and when you're dealing with poetic artifice. I must not rejoice as I would do when I behold that these psalms are become so well attired abroad and so ill at home. What's he saying? He's not speaking of the Sydney Psalms. He's, he's speaking of the Sternhold and Hopkins as well as the Miles Coverdale version. The psalms are well in chambers, meaning private reading. The psalms are good, 
but in thy church they are ill. Speaking not only of Sternhold and Hopkins, but also the Miles Coverdale versions. As far as I can scarce call that reformed until this be reformed, would a whole state present a lesser gift than some one man hath sent? This is directly to Miles Coverdale, who translated single-handedly the Book of Psalms for the Book of Common Prayer. He's saying, would you give a gift, a lesser gift made by one man to a king? So why would you give back the Psalms to God in praise that have just been translated by one person and so poorly? And shall our church unto our spouse and king more hoarse, more harsh, than any other sing? For that we pray, we praise thy name for this, which by this Moses and this Miriam is already done. And remember these figures from our introduction who were singing the ode, the Song of the Sea, Moses' ode in Exodus 15. They were brother and sister, and so done is, a, is making allusion to this brother and sister, Mary and Philip. And as those psalms we call, though some have other authors, David's all, so though some have, some may have psalms translate, we thy Sydneyan psalms shall celebrate until we come the extemporal song to sing that's in heaven where we need no psalm books. Learn to the first hour that we see the king who hath translated those translators. Translated to move into a different state, so resurrected or after death, they are translated to heaven, and yet they are also the translators of the psalm. So a little wordplay here, typical of done. May these their learned labors all the way be as our tuning, that when hence we part, we may fall in with them and sing our part. Really nice conclusion here. This idea of that the Psalms tune our spirits is something that Dunn will use in his own devotional poetry. I tune the instrument at the door, Dunn says, getting ready for death, so that when we depart, we may fall in with them, the Sydneys who are in heaven, and sing our part. So what Dunn is recognizing here is the artistic value of the Psalms and how the previous psalm translations are found lacking in comparison to the Sydney psalms. Mary Herbert specifically, her translations are valued for their lyrical expressions and praised for beauty, for sweetness, for sincerity. And it helped establish and convince poets that the English language was a suitable medium for religious expression and devotional piety. And this paved the way for some of England's greatest devotional poets. So I hope you'll enjoy exploring her poetry a little bit more. I have a link in the description below where you can read her poems uh, and the translated version. There's a free edition online, several free editions. So explore those, but also keep this in mind as we move forward in the series because we'll be returning to Mary Sidney Herbert just to see how she's influenced some of the, the greatest English devotional poets. So thanks everyone for watching. I hope this was helpful, and I'll see you all in the next video.